Let's pray. Amen. I'm not sure how many of you are able to keep up with the classes that occur in Arkansas. <coughs> but if you have been keeping up with those studies, you'll realize in the last few weeks that we're re-examining Daniel chapter 2. And part of that work involves re-looking at or re-examining our understanding of Revelation 17. An examination of Revelation 17 is an extensive study. Um, and one of the components that I wanted to look at now was not Revelation 17, but a few verses in Daniel chapter, four, uh, Daniel chapter 2 um, so that you can be aware of some of the discussions that we're having within this movement. So, as a way of introduction, what I want to do is do a brief overview of our understanding of Daniel chapter 2, 7, 8, and into 11. So, this will just be a brief introduction, really, um, to explain the, the premise or the reasoning behind our understanding of Daniel 2. The reason why we're re-examining Daniel 2, you may or may not be aware that there is a very nice way of understanding how these histories at the end of the world, this statue in particular, um, can have a reapplication in the visions of the book of Daniel. So a number of you are aware of that. Um, some of you may not be aware of it. Is anybody doesn't know what I'm talking about or isn't quite aware of things? Okay, so maybe if we turn to Ezekiel chapter 21, I'm just going to, I'm just here, it's, it's, it's not my, I'm not trying to defend or prove anything. I'm just trying to explain part of the reasoning behind this. Um, <coughs> Alan White gives a commentary on the passage that we're just about to read. And we'll read the passage first and I'll explain the commentary that she's going to speak about. And let's begin at, we'll begin at, at, at chapter 21, verse 1. But we're not going to read the whole chapter, I'm going to skip through some of the verses. So the, the background of Ezekiel 21, um, you probably already know that Ezekiel has been taken captive um, from memory, I believe his captivity was in the reign of Jehoiakim, the second from the last king. You have Jehoiakim, where Daniel and his um, three friends were taken. And then there's a second captivity that's, um, that, that occurs a few years later uh, in the reign of Jehoiakim, who only reigns for a short amount of time, three months. And then he gets sent into Babylon, into captivity. And during that um, captivity, many thousands of Israelites were, were, were sent to Babylon. And Ezekiel is part of that number. And when he's in Babylon, he's going to begin to preach against the f about the final destruction that's going to occur in Jerusalem. And that's what chapter 21 is dealing with. 
Verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face toward Jerusalem, and drop thy word toward the holy places, and prophesy against the land of Israel. And say to the land of Israel, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I am against thee, and will draw forth my sword out of his sheath, and will cut off from thee the righteous and the wicked. Seeing then that I will cut off from thee the righteous and the wicked, therefore shall my sword go forth out of his sheath against all flesh from the south to the north. Now, after the last presentation, um, I was having a discussion with somebody about the rights and wrongs of understanding things, of how God is going to deal with people who perhaps don't understand things in the same way other people do. But I would just bring to our attention that in the three, uh, three or four verses that we've just read, in verse 4 it says, Seeing then that I will cut off from thee the righteous and the wicked. You can see here, if you're willing to, that this destruction that's going to be brought to Jerusalem is not just going to affect those who are wicked, it will affect the righteous. So this destruction that's coming is going to affect everybody. We could read through the, the rest of the, um, the chapter, but I want to concentrate on the last few verses. So we want to pick up from verse, um, let's pick up from verse 23. Verse 23 is dealing with a divination um, of the king of Babylon. And it shall be unto them a false divination in their sight, to them that have sworn oaths. But he will call to remembrance the iniquity that they may be taken. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Because ye have made your iniquity to be remembered, in that your transgressions are discovered, so that in all your doings your sins do appear, because I say that ye are come to remembrance, ye shall be taken with the hand. And thou, profane, wicked prince of Israel, whose day is come when iniquity shall have an end. So verse 25 is talking about a wicked prince in Israel. It's quite straightforward to see that. And it says, whose day is come. So the day of judgment has come to this wicked prince. And then it says, when iniquity shall have an end. Now a, a surface reading of that might make you think that this person is repenting because iniquity shall have an end so that you might have some inference that they're repenting so that there's no more sin. But that's not what this verse is teaching. This verse is teaching that when this, this wicked prince's day has come, judgment ceases. Probation closes for this person and whatever condition you find them in, whether they're righteous or good, that it says iniquity shall have its end, so there's no more investigation of this person's conduct or behaviour because their probation closes. So verse 25 is talking about the close of probation of this wicked prince, this wicked profane prince, and he's the prince of Israel. Now when it says Israel here, we need to understand that hundreds of years before this, after Solomon, the nation split between the ten tribes and the two tribes, and they, they go under various names, but the southern tribes, the two tribes, are normally called Judah, and the ten tribes are called either Ephraim or Israel. But when it's been spoken of here of Israel, it's talking about the two tribes of Judah and Benjamin, the, the, the two southern tribes. But it uses the word Israel in this, in this passage, but it's only talking about those two tribes. Um, so, most people here are probably familiar with the seven last kings of Judah. Um, there's Manasseh, Ammon, Josiah, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiakin, and Zedekiah. And I've already explained that during the history of these two kings, Jehoiakim and Jehoiakin, that, Babel, uh, that uh, Daniel and Ezekiel are taken captive. And we're in this time period here in Ezekiel 21. 
And what he's prophesying is the demise or the fall of Judah under the reign of Zedekiah. So that's the context of who this profane and wicked king is. It says, And thou profane wicked prince Zedekiah of Israel, whose day is come when iniquity shall have an end. So when he comes to the end of his reign, he reigns for 11 years, then when probation closes for him and for the rest of the nation, God's no longer going to be investigating or considering their iniquity. It's come to an end. There's no more investigation. Verse 26, Thus saith the Lord God, Remove the diadem and take off the crown. This shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. So it talks about the removal of the diadem and the crown. So Zedekiah has a crown here. And when it comes to his last days, whose day has come, it says that his crown that he has is going to be removed from him. And then verse 27 says, I will overturn, overturn, overturn. It, sorry, I will overturn, overturn it, and it shall be no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it him. Now Ellen White comments on this passage so that you know we really don't need to second guess what's being discussed here. And when it says about the overturning, you'll see that it's mentioned three times. It says overturn, overturn, overturn. So there are three overturns. And it says, until, or then. And what's been overturned after Zedekiah, this is Judah, is these nations that come in sequence afterwards. So what's going to happen is that this crown is going to be passed from one kingdom to the next in sequential order, from this one to this one, until an event happens here and it tells you what the event is. It says, until he comes whose right it is and I will give it him. So this, whoever this person is, he has a right to it and it's going to be given him. So, there's this thing that's going to be given him, and the, and the it is this crown. So, if you just look on this statue, it's not hard to see that the nations that come after Judah are Babylon, Medo Persia, and then Greece. So, it says, I will overturn, overturn, overturn. And this overturning will stop. So by the time this nation is overturned, you're going to come into, a, into another dispensation, another history. And we know this history is the history of Rome. So after these nations have been overturned and Rome has taken the ascendancy, then in this time period, someone's going to come whose right it is to have this crown or this throne. And we know that Rome comes in two phases. So in the time period of pagan Rome, Christ comes on the scene and Christ is the one who has the right to this crown or this diadem. And if you think about this crown, you should have a... It's a crown is a, is a symbol of a kingship, a rulership, and then you have a throne that goes associated with that. And we know that when Christ came in the time period of pagan Rome, he established uh, a kingdom or a throne of grace. So, you know, that's pretty straightforward to, to understand. Alan White comments on this passage, and when she comments on it, she doesn't take you to this setting here where Christ comes at his first advent. She jumps millennia into the future and places it in the time of his second advent. So she's going to take this history off over these three overturnings. When you get to Rome, she's not going to be focusing on this history at the first advent. 
She's going to be focusing on the history of the second advent. Where we understand about the throne of glory is going to be set up. And we obviously know that Rome is still in power here. This statue takes you right through the ages, right to the end of the world. And all of this history between the legs and the feet and into the toes is all Rome. So it's a legitimate understanding to realize that when Christ comes the first time or the second time, first advent or second advent, it's all in the time period of Rome. This period is pagan Rome and this period is papal Rome. So when you begin to see the truth that Ezekiel 21 opens up to us, we can begin to see that when we look at this statue and we see that Christ came the first time in, this, in the history of pagan Rome and he's going to come the second time in the history of papal Rome, but all of this is Rome, that we can begin to develop an understanding that Christ comes twice, his first advent and his second advent. And you can begin to do a really nice study to show how the kingdoms of Bible prophecy repeat at the end of the world and they had these different representations um, at the end of the world that they're real powers that are being spoken of. Do you have a reference uh, uh, for that LMA Well, I'll try and do, I'll try and find it in the break um, unless someone's got a computer and they can look it up. Um, I, I, might be, I might be able to do it straight away actually. It shouldn't be that hard to find. Do you have the reference for it? Did you say it all? No, I just oh, okay. referencing in Ezekiel 21 27, correct? She's commenting on that. Yeah. Verse. Um, yeah, so we, so we could do it through that. I shouldn't be. I should be able to find it reasonably quickly. Hopefully, um, education, page one. Oh, it's in the it's in the Bible commentaries. I thought it might be. Yeah. Um, so let me see where I'll read from. I pick up from one seventy eight point three. Education one seventy eight point three. The history which the great I am has marked out in his word until you through uniting link after link in the prophetic chain from eternity in the past to eternity into the future tells us where we are today in the procession of the ages and what may be expected in the time to come. All that prophecy has foretold has come into pass until the present time has been traced on the pages of history and we may be assured that all that which is yet to come will be fulfilled in its order. The final overthrow of all earthly dominions is plainly foretold in the word of truth, in the prophecy uttered when sentence from God was pronounced upon the last king of Israel, is given the message. Thus saith the Lord God, remove the diadem and take off the crown, exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it shall be no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it him. The crown removed from Israel passed successively to the kingdoms of Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, and Rome, just as I've drawn out there. God says it shall be no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it him. So you can see straight away from an uh, understanding of Ezekiel 21 that when the time you get to, to Rome, there's not going to be any more kingdoms after Rome. Rome is the final and last kingdom on earth. Um, so everything we understand about prophecy is correct. So when people talk about all the different nations that are rising up, whether it's China or the USSR or the resurgence even of the USSR, you know, those things are not valid fulfillments of prophecy because prophecy clearly teaches that Rome will be established from the time from pagan Rome right to the end of the world. And she's just confirming this. God says it shall be no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it him. That time is at hand. Today the signs of the times declare that we are standing on the threshold of great and solemn events. Everything in our world is in agitation. Before our eyes is fulfilling the Saviour's prophecy of the events to precede his coming. Yet shall he sh yet sorry, ye shall hear of wars and rumours of wars. Nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. 
So she's talking here about the second advent of Christ. Before I rise to fulfilling the Savior's prophecy of the events to precede his coming. So when it talks about he shall come, whose right it is, and it will be given him, she's refocusing on the second advent. But you can also understand this too have occurred when Christ came the first time. So the reason why that's important is because our understanding of the vision in Daniel chapter 2 in this statue, its relationship to the mountain, has an impact on our understanding of how these things are going to be fulfilled at the end of the world. So I'll just rub all this off. So I just want to have a quick review, as I said, of the prophecies of Daniel 2, 7, 8 and 11. I'm just going to draw a, a, a table. Um, maybe I think I probably need more room than that. So we're going to have um, five columns. And this is chapter 11, chapter 8, chapter 7, and chapter 2. The reason why we're having this discussion is because there are various views, even between people in this message, about some of the symbology in Daniel chapter 2. And we want to make sure that everybody's on the same page. So we know the four kingdoms that we're dealing with. We have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece. Part of Greece, I'm going to put Alexander the Great. And then I'm going to be looking at, his, at the four divisions of Greece. And then we'll look at Rome and its divisions. Then the papacy. Then we're going to talk about the sealing of God's people. then the fall of the earthly empires and then finally I'll put God's kingdom as it's possessed by the saints so you can find all of this information in all of these chapters. So in chapter 2, Babylon is identified as gold and as a lion in chapter 7. And in chapter 8 and chapter 11, you do not see Babylon. Silver. There, a ram, and it mentions this as Persia. This is 11 2. And in Greece, we're all probably familiar with this brass, a leopard, a goat. And then it mentions it as Grecia, also in 11 verse 2. And then it mentions Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great isn't mentioned in chapter 2 or chapter 7, but here it's mentioned as a great horn. And here in Daniel 11 it's mentioned as a 
great king. And she says, mighty. And then it speaks about the four divisions of Greece. It doesn't mention it in Daniel chapter 2, but in chapter 7, it mentions four heads. Chapter 8, it mentions four horns. It calls them notable ones. And here it says the kingdom is divided. towards the four winds of heaven. And then you get Rome in its divisions. Here it just mentions it as iron. Then it mentions the ten-horned beast of Daniel 7. And in chapter 8 it calls this the little horn. And here, the phrase I'm picking up, it says, he that comes against him. This is Daniel eleven sixteen, And we know that this is the king of the north, by the way. But we also know that Greece was also identified as the king of the north. And then we have the papal domination. This is iron and clay. This is the little horn. This is also the little horn. And this is called the king of 1136. And I don't know if we all are aware that when Uriah Smith writes his commentary on this chapter, he changes this from the king to a king. And that subtle difference makes a big change in his understanding of the last six verses of that chapter. So the king, which is 1136, is also de identifying the king of the north as well. So all of these three powers are called the king of the north. Then we talk about the sealing of God's people. And this is identified here as the stone that is cut out of the mountain. Here's brought to view the judgment. Here is the cleansing of the sanctuary. And here we can identify tidings out of the <coughs> the east and the north. It's verse 44. And then you see the fall of these empires and the image is broken and it's blown away. It's blown away by a wind. And here it says his dominion is consumed and destroyed. And in chapter 8, he says that he will be broken without hand. And here, he comes to his end in the glorious holy mountain and Michael stands up. And then lastly, the saints receive or obtain possession of the earth. Sorry about this. And here we see that there's a mountain that fills the earth. Daniel 7, it says that the kingdom is given to the saints. There's nothing in Daniel chapter 8 
And it says in Daniel 12 that the wise shall shine forever. So you might be asking yourself, why spend the time and make the effort to, to go through these things which are so basic and fundamental? So the reason why we found it necessary to, to go through these things for, uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, there isn't agreement upon the definition of the visions that we <coughs> have discussed in some of the previous studies that we've just had about the Hazon vision, the Marer and the Marah vision. There's not clarity on what those things are referring to. And laying these visions out in this simple fashion, um, I feel helps us to get clarity on what's going on. So for instance, when I spoke about in Daniel chapter 8, and I said that the Hazon vision was the vision of the 2300 days, and then at the very end of this process, you see the Marae vision, which is Christ working in his sanctuary. You can quickly see that the cleansing of the sanctuary here is dealing with the Marae vision, and all of this history before this is dealing with the Hazon. So, maybe if I put a dotted line here. So, in Daniel chapter 8, you can see the activities of the ram, the goat, um, the great horn, the, f the split into the four horns, and then the work activity of the little horn. All of this is the Hazon vision, it's the 2300 day prophecy, and then you have the cleansing of the sanctuary. So, we've already discussed that, and... I think there's a level of agreement on that. But when you do that, what you begin to see is that if you line these chapters up, that they're all following the same sequence. So if we can see this in Daniel chapter 8, then you can begin to see that we can take this thought and idea right the way through into Daniel chapter 2. And then right into Daniel chapter 8, sorry, Daniel chapter 11. So as soon as you can begin to conceptualize this relationship between the Hazon vision and the Marae vision in Daniel chapter 8, and you line these visions up in this way, you can begin to see that the story, which is obvious that this story here is the same as this story here, that then this must also be the Hazon vision, and this must be the Hazon vision, and this must be the Hazon vision. And then if that's the case, and then we speak about the cleansing of the sanctuary being the Marae vision, then you know that the Marae vision, or the cleansing of the sanctuary, is the same as the judgment. It's the same as the stone being cut out, and it's the same as these tidings out of the east and out of the north that are brought to view. Now, that really shouldn't be a surprise to us because we'll read a statement and unfortunately I've only got this, I think, from a reference which is hopefully I've got a reference. I'll come back to the passage. There's a night nice statement, I think it's in Great Controversy, but I have it normally in my notes, um, in Faith I Live By. And it says something along the line, someone's probably going to find it for me, that she says that the judgment of Daniel 7 
is the same as the cleansing of the sanctuary in Daniel 8, is the same as the parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25, and is the same as the messenger of the covenant suddenly coming to his temple. So I'm working on a new set of notes that um, have escaped me, so I'm just going to see if I can quickly find it. I'll, t- I'll, I'll look for it during the break of the next presentation. It's a fairly f- standard passage that we, that, we, that we probably all know about in case someone's going to look for it. I know my sister's already looking for it. Um, so you can, you can link these two up very simply. There's a nice Ellen White statement that does this for us. But the reason why this is a, a, a powerful way to look at this is because it allows you to cross-reference one vision with another. And the experience that's being brought to view here in the cleansing of the sanctuary is the same experience that's being brought to view in the judgment and the stone being cut out and the setting up of God's kingdom and the fall of the empires. All of these things begin to line up. And so what I want us to see is that the way the visions are structured in Daniel is that this is talking about Satan's kingdom and this is talking about God's kingdom. The reason why it's nice, in fact more than nice, it's important to understand this, is because often we limit our our understanding or our perspective of the work of Christ to the sanctuary. And so on this 1850 chart, we have the work of the sanctuary being brought to view here. And when we talk about the cleansing of the sanctuary, sometimes I think we can have a very limited understanding of what this truth God is trying to teach us. Especially when we you know, consider the passage when it says, Thy way, O Lord, is in the sanctuary. Because this idea about the work of the sanctuary is a bit broader than just dealing with this issue of the sanctuary service. It deals with the judgment it deals with the setting up or, or cutting out of the stone, which is a representation of God's people, and how God's people are going to engage with Rome at the end of the world and bring it to its knees. It's you found it? Great controversy, yeah. 424. Is what he's saying. Yeah. I'm not sure why I can't find it in my notes. Should I go ahead and read that? <laughs> oh, well, you can, you'll have to flip through it. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, the one I remember is slightly different. I'll, I'll find it. I think it's a different one that I'm thinking of. Thank you. Not, not to worry. So, the reason why this is important to understand is that there are many people who have a misunderstanding of what this clay represents in Daniel chapter 2. And we want to do a short study on this clay but first, before we do a study on this clay, what I'm hoping that we can see is that when we go through lining up these chapters, that we can see the reign of the papacy is lining up with this time period of iron and clay, which lines up with the little horn, which lines up with the little horn of Daniel chapter 8, and it's referring to the king of... Daniel chapter 11.
Now, if we turn to Daniel chapter 8, verse 12. Let's read Daniel chapter 8, verse 12. And the host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. So we've already mentioned that when you begin to see these four verses from verse 9 to verse 12, Okay, I found I found the passage. It's um, I'm going to pick it up from. Uh, actually, I will find it in the Great Controversy. It's 426.1. Okay, it it, it was. Um, so, Great Controversy 426.1. The coming of Christ as our High Priest to the Most Holy Place for the cleansing of the sanctuary brought to view in Daniel 8.14. So that's what we've got, Daniel 8.14. The coming of Christ as a high priest in the most holy place for the cleansing of the sanctuary. The coming of the Son of Man to the Ancient of Days as presented in Daniel 7.13. And the coming of the Lord to his temple foretold by Malachi are descriptions of the same event. And this is also represented by the coming of the bridegroom to the marriage described by Christ in the parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25. GC 426.1 So this passage confirms and defines that the cleansing of the sanctuary in Daniel 8 is the same as the judgment in Daniel 7. So when I'm making the claim that the creation of the stone and the destruction of the image, which is the setting up of God's kingdom here in Daniel 2, which is the tidings out of the east and how the king of the north comes to his end when he makes war with God's people on the king of the, in the most gl uh, in the glorious holy mountain and that the wise shine forever when they receive their kingdom that these two verses these set of verses in these two chapters are the same verses that are being dealt with here because here we already have an inspired statement that connects these two together and if this is the Marais vision right here If this is the Marais vision and this is the Hazon vision, then this Marais vision must be the same as this Marais vision. The judgment, dominion is he's destroyed and the kingdom is given to the saints. Then this also must be the Marais vision. And if you've got two chapters teaching the same thing and you see the alignment of the, all these four chapters, then you know that this must also be the Marais vision and this must also be the Marais vision. So the reason why I bring that up is because sometimes we think that the Maria vision is only dealing with Christ as we see him in the symbology of entering into the sanctuary, but it's a bit more broader than that. So that's one thing we can learn from, from, from this study. And the other thing I want to bring to view is in Daniel chapter 8, verse 12, which we've just read here, it's talking about this verse here, talking about the little horn in its papal face. So most people, I think, assented to the idea that they see in the last, in these four verses from 9 to 12, that they see pagan and papal Rome. So most people have uh, uh, agreed that they see that. And in Daniel 2, it's easier to see. You see, you see it in both ways. You see legs, and you see feet and toes, and you see iron and, you see iron and clay. So it's really clear to see it in Daniel 2. You see it through the body parts and also through the different materials. When you come to Daniel 7, it's, you can still see it, but it's a little bit harder now. 
Now you've got an iron beast with ten horns, and then you see another little horn that comes up afterwards. But it shows you the connection between the two because the little horn is on the head of this beast. But in Daniel chapter 8, it's virtually impossible to see when you look at it on the surface because you've got the little horn and you've got the little horn. It's the same entity and you don't see any distinction between the two. But we understand that you can see the different phases of Rome through gender. So let me just put gender here. Does everybody know what that means about, about the gender and how, how we define that and how that works? Yeah? Um, but when you come to Daniel 11, there is no visibility, there's no way for you to see which phases of Rome that you're dealing with. The only way you can see that is by looking at those verses and understanding the history that surrounds um, the word King of the North. There's no, there's no gender issue, there's no symbology to show this King of the North is any different to this King of the North. You have to have a clear understanding of that history. So, as you go from Daniel 2 to Daniel 11, it becomes harder and harder to see the two phases of Rome. This is, without understanding the history that's being discussed here, you just don't see any visibility of how it switches from um, Greece to pagan Rome and to papal Rome. Daniel 8 is relatively easy to see once you understand the issue of gender, and Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 are relatively easy to see. Daniel 2 is very easy to see because you've got legs and feet, the separation is clear. Um, so when we talk about the gender here, we all know that, I, I assume that we know that the little horn that's being discussed here is, is a fixed gender. In fact, you only see it in verse 9. The word little horn is only discussed in verse 9. And what you see after that are pronouns. And the pronouns it says is he, and then it says in it. Now in the original language in the Hebrew, there are no pronouns in that language. Um, the way you see it is through the verbs or the activity. So in the original, it's the verbs that have gender. It doesn't say he or she in the original, it's the, it's the verbs. And those verbs have masculine or feminine um, information attached to that, to that activity that, uh, that gives you the ability to, de to define one way or the other. Now when it was translated into the English and it says it, that was a mistranslation. It should have said she, but the King James translators didn't want to put he and she in, in these verses, so they left it with it. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a mistranslation to call it it. It should really be she. Having said all that, when we go into verse 12, it says the following. It says a host was given, it says him, but it's italicized, so we, we know it shouldn't be there. So a host is given against the daily by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospers. So you see some history that's being spoken of here, and let me just give a potted history of verse 12. So I'm looking at verse 12, and the verse begins in the year 496. It moves on to the year 508, and then goes on to the year 538. So there are three distinct periods that are being discussed in this verse, which we just want to have a quick look at. It says, a host was given. So in 496, a host is given to the papacy. Now we know the papacy is a church. Sometimes we try to make the papacy into an entity that isn't a church. We try to make it pagan or some kind of pseudo-church, but it is a real church. It's a real Christian church, um, and Bible prophecy teaches us that it is. So here's this church, and here's a host, which is an army that's being given to it. So there's a church-state relationship, and the first thing you know that there's a problem with this church-state relationship because whenever you get married, you know that a woman or the, or, the, or the wife is given to a husband. But this passage switches it around and it says that the husband is given to the wife. So as soon as you, as soon as you see that, you know that there's a problem in this relationship. 
So this host that's given to the papacy is in 496, and the historical fulfillment of that was that Clovis, who was the king of France, the king of the Franks, he pledges himself and his sword and his empire and his, uh, his country to the service of the papacy. He was called something along the line as the first son of the papacy. So he's the person who gives himself to the papacy. Historically, that's what, e that's what actually happened, and that's what's being brought to view in this verse. So you can see here a church-state relationship. And the purpose for this church-state relationship, it says in the verse very clearly, is to make war against the daily. So I'll write Clovis here. Clovis is one of these ten horns that we see in this passage here. And he's going to make war against the daily. And this war that he's making against the daily is the war with the Visigoths. The Visigoths were one of these ten horns. And they're a power that are, are, are an obstacle to the papacy rising to supremacy. So he pledges his sword... Uh, he converts to Christianity, to Catholicism in 496. And a few short years later, he begins to make war with the Visigoths. And they eventually come to a truce. And the obstacle that the Visigoths were presenting for the papacy to rise to the throne is done away with. And then by the, f by the year 538, the papacy is ruling now. And it says in the last part of the verse... And it practiced and prospered. This practice and prospering is what it does between the years 538 and 1798, which is the 1260 as we know. So what I'm saying is that verse 12 in chapter 8, which is dealing with this little horn power, is dealing with a church that's in transgression. It says in the verse, by reason of transgression, and we know that the, who the entity that's transgressing is. It's not Clovis. Clovis is a pagan king who really has no allegiance to God. But the papacy makes a profession of being the church, of being the bride of Christ, and she's supposed to be married to Christ, but here she is getting into a relationship with the state. So she's in transgression. So there's this transgression going on, which is a church-state relationship that begins in 496 for the purpose of eradicating or neutralizing the Visigoths so that the papacy can practice and prosper from the year 538 to 1798. And that's what's being brought to view here in verse 12. And this church-state relationship is the very church-state relationship that's brought to view here in the imagery in Daniel 2 of iron and clay. So hopefully that's straightforward and people don't have any any issues with that. Now when we look at the the symbology of this iron and clay in chapter 2. So let's turn to Daniel chapter 2. most of this stuff off that's in on the board here. Um, Could you just tell me what that verse is on the first part of God's kingdom, something God's people? Sealing. 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 Okay, Sealing of God's people. Okay, that one, the last one says, the last one. What? God's kingdom. Oh, that says God's kingdom. Okay. I've got B there. I don't know why. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to rub most of this off now because we don't need it. There's a, there's a lot more information you can get from this uh, by, by cross-referencing all of these um, chapters. By the way, we're only, I'm only trying to address one, one specific issue. Um, but when you begin to realize the relationship between these chapters and the visions that are being discussed here, it, um, it really does deepen our understanding of, of what these visions are referring to and what they mean. 
but I'm only, I'm only focusing on one portion of this uh, of these visions, and it's the issue of what that clay represents in Daniel chapter two. So the the primary argument that I want to bring to for, bring to view is that in Daniel chapter two, when it says iron and clay, this is a parallel passage to the host and the papacy. This is Daniel 8.12 and this is Daniel 2. And it, Daniel 2, it occurs in a number of different verses. So I'm just going to write Daniel 2. So the iron and clay is the same as the host and the papacy. So the argument or the position that I'm taking is that this clay is a representation of the papacy. So the army, the, so the iron is state, yeah, it's statecraft and churchcraft. So this is the the army that does it, the work for the papacy. Depending on what portion of history you're going to go into, that army will change as you go through history. But it's the states that unite with the papacy doing that work, or doing the work for it. So let's read verse 41. Actually, what we'll do is, well, let me just make a, let me just make a short t a little table here. And we'd line up verse 33, and then verse 41, 42, and 43. Chapter 2, we're in chapter 2. And then verse 34 and verse 35 and 44 and 45. So these are all the verses in Daniel chapter 2 that deal with the issue of clay. Part of the problem you're going to come across when you do a study on the clay in Daniel chapter 2 is that from verse 4, Daniel chapter 2 verse 4, from 2 verse 4 right through to 728, the language that the book of Daniel is written in changes. So this is chapter 1 and the first part of chapter 2. And this is chapter 8 to 12. This is written in Hebrew, <coughs> as is this. And this is written in Aramaic. Or Chaldean. So they're actually, it's actually written in a different language. So if you try and do any kind of Bible study or any kind of word study on all the chapters between 2 and 7, sometimes you can hit a roadblock because you don't have any references. So you have to be careful how you study these verses because you, what you want to find is a Hebrew equivalent of some of those words so that you can do a further word study of that. Can you address some of the, just like the little tiny nuances of that? When you, if you assign clay to the papacy, how that the mixing of the mixing of iron and clay won't happen. So I'm going to yeah I'm going to try and discuss some of that. Um, so for instance, when if you do a study on if you're going to do a word study on clay and you go to Daniel chapter two and you pick up the word clay, go into Strong's Concordance, you're only going to find passages in the scripture that are contained within the book of Daniel, specifically Daniel chapter two, because all the other words that are found in the Bible of clay are actually Hebrew words, they're not Aramaic words. So you have to be a bit careful when you do that study to make sure that you're a bit more inclusive on how you're going to study that word out, otherwise you'll come to a dead end. So let's go ahead and read the verses first. Verse 33. So verse, this column here, verse 33, 34 and 35, um, I want to call it the description. 
This is the description of the dream that Daniel's going to give to Nebuchadnezzar, and this is the interpretation. So you have the description of the dream and interpretation. So you're going to see as we run down, I got, I'll do the column first. So 33, he's all he tells you is the legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Verse 34, thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Verse 35, then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So you've got three references there in those three verses to clay. Switching over to verse 41, it reads, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. Verse 42, And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Verse 43, and whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings, uh, in the days of these kings, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand for ever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God has made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. The dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. So there are all the passages that deal with this issue of clay, but we want to focus our, our attention on verses 41 to 43. Many people, when they approach verse 41 to 43, See, the term that's brought to view here when it says potter's clay and miry clay that these two terms are representing some kind of progressive um, degeneration in this clay. And wh what I mean by that is many people see this starting off as good and ending up as bad. Many, m m lots of people have this understanding and um, there are some views, um, even amongst people in this movement, who, who have this perspective about the relationship between potter's clay and miry clay, that it's good and bad. And what I mean by that is that they suggest that this somehow is a representation of God's people or God's church. And then, it, the, then there's a story that goes from this point to this point, how that God's people at this stage was good, and then they become bad. So when we drew that table out, hopefully you could see by lining up these passages, Daniel 8.12, with Daniel 2, and we're looking specifically here 41 to 43, that you can see that this understanding isn't correct, that it's not a representation of some clay that starts off good and ends up becoming bad. Because when you go to Daniel chapter 8, you see that this is a story about the host, which is Rome, the, the state of Rome, in, in this particular verse, it's actually dealing with Clovis, who is a part of pagan Rome, and the papacy, and how they have a relationship one with another. And it clearly tells you that this church is in transgression. Hopefully we can see that, that it says that, it, the church is in transgression. Sorry? Which church? So, if we go to Daniel chapter 8, verse, let's go to Daniel chapter 8. We are, we're not going to read the verses, but we go through 9, 10, 11, and 12. 
And if we go to the verses before, it talks about a ram and a goat. From verses 3 to verse 8, it talks about a ram and a goat. And it's going to define who that, who that ram and that goat is. It's going to tell you that it's the Medes and Persians. And it's going to tell you that this is Greece. And it will define who the notable horn is and who the, f sorry, who the great horn is and the four notable ones. So you can develop a clear understanding of what the ram and the goat represent. It represents the rise and fall um, of both the Medo-Persia Medo Empire and Greece. And then in this verse 9, it talks about the little horn. So maybe, maybe we went, I went through that table too quickly because sometimes I think it's so elementary people don't even see the point of doing it but maybe we should have spent a bit more time laboring with that um, that this little horn power is being brought to view in these four verses it says it quite clearly in verse 9 chapter 8 verse 9 it, it reads that out of one of them came forth a little horn so without getting into the technicalities of, of how to decipher this, these verses, it's, it talks about a little horn coming, coming forth. And then in verse 10 it says, and it wax great. So the it that's being referred to must be referring to the little horn. And then verse 11 says, yea, he magnified himself. And so that he must also be referring to the little horn. And verse 12 is going to say the same thing. And a host was given him, regardless of the gender issue, um, in verse 12. So all those three verses that come after verse 9 are all talking about the little horn. So this is the power of the little horn from verses 9 to 12. Then you have the question and answer session between Christ and Gabriel at the end. It says, how long is the daily in the transgression of desolation? Um, how long is the vision that concerns these two things going to be for as they trample down the host and the sanctuary? So Hopefully that's relatively straightforward. If we don't line up these chapters it, at its most basic level without getting into the intricacies of what's being taught here, what we will miss is that each of these chapters teaches a truth. And the truth is this, that it's going to show you Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, in, its, in, its, in, those, in that sequential story, even though... Babylon isn't brought to view in Daniel chapter 8. So we know that it's going to teach that. And the other thing that we quickly realize is that all of these visions, when it comes to the fourth empire, which is Rome, so this is Rome, it shows Rome in two phases, phase 1 and phase 2. All the chapters do that consistently. In Daniel chapter 11, it calls it the king of the north in both phases, but you can see that it's talking about pagan Rome and papal Rome. It's not that hard to see when you get into that history. Daniel 2, you can see the legs and the feet. There's a difference between the two. It talks about it in both of these charts. As, um, it says it more clearly here. It says Rome divided. So you can see a division there. And in chapter 7, you see an iron beast which has got ten horns, and after that period of time, after a certain amount of period of time, then you see a little horn that comes up after them. So you know that you can see these two phases of Rome occurring. So when we come to Daniel 8 and we see only a little horn, but we see it occurring in these four verses, then we would expect to be able to see the two phases of Rome. And the way we're able to see that is through the activities of this little horn, what it does, and there's gender attached to that activity. So we know that this is masculine, and this is feminine, and this is masculine, and this is feminine. So, d you're okay with, at that level? I, I'm not trying to get you to pause on the differences between the iron oh, okay. and the legs and then the clay, whether it's two phases of Rome. Yeah. It's the statement of the clay okay. being Rome, or being the papacy. That, if I, if I'm, unless I'm yeah. wrong. Yeah, that's, that's the difference there. That's okay. It tells us that we know there's two separations, papal and pagan Rome. Okay. So if history is teaching us that there's two phases, pagan and papal Rome, yeah. then these visions should be teaching that. The vision of 
Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, and Daniel 11. So if you do a cursory study on, on what clay represents, mm -hmm. so clay is a representation of God's people at some level. You'd agree with that? Sure. So God's people, sorry, not God's level, God's people. God's people are a church. And what I'm suggesting is when you line up these visions, one with another, when it comes to this issue of clay, you've got two options to look at clay. You can say it's a representation of God's people. For instance, ancient Israel or the Seventh-day Adventist church, it's God's people, God's church. Or you can see it as a representation of a church because the definition of a church is someone is a body of people who have married Christ. So when you come to this verse here, when it says that a host is given to it, to her, you know that that's a relationship between a state and a church. So you see a church and a state relationship in 12. So this church here, if it is a church, and I'm suggesting that it is a church, this is the church which is representing the papacy. Would you agree with that? The horn represented the papacy. This is the horn. The horn. This is the little horn. Yeah. Because it says that a host was given it. Mm -hmm. But this little horn in this phase is actually a church. Okay. So do you agree with that? And you, we, we know that's the case because you can see it in many other places. And once this church gets into relationship with the state, this church is in transgression. So in Daniel chapter 8, you see a state where you have transgression going on. And the person who's transgressing is the church. So my initial suggestion is, my initial thoughts is when you see that there's a church that's in transgression in Daniel chapter 8, you would see that this is the same story in Daniel 7 and Daniel 2 because it must be dealing with the same entity, the same power. So in Daniel chapter 7, you're going to have a beast and here's his head and he's going to have ten horns. And it says, once those ten horns have all risen up, and what is the rising of those ten horns represent? It's representing the breakup of Western Europe during the time period of the demise of, the, of pagan Rome. It says, after this, then a little horn rises up. So there's this little horn that rises up. So this is first, and this is second. And then it says at the behest of this little horn, three of these things are plucked up. So who's, doing the, who's commanding that these horns be plucked up? It's this little horn is doing that commanding. But it doesn't have the ability to do that. It doesn't have the ability to, to pluck up anybody. Because if we, take the, we, if we take the understanding that this is the papacy, and you run it into chapter 8, you know this papacy is a church. And the church has no army to do its bidding. So built into all this imagery, when it's going to pluck up three of these horns, we know that the person that's going to do that work for it has to be a state. And we know who that, who that empire was that did that. That was the Byzantine Empire. It was the Byzantine Empire that took down those three horns for it. Or we might call it Eastern Pagan Rome. Or the Eastern Roman Empire. So you can see in Daniel 7 there's a church-state relationship going on between Rome and the papacy, between a state and a church. It's the same story that you see in Daniel chapter 8. But in Daniel chapter 8, it makes it a lot clearer because it talks about this issue of transgression. And it gives you the, the, the gender that it's feminine. Feminine referring to a woman, a woman refers to a church. So you have two testimonies that here you have a church-state relationship 
a church-state relationship. And this church, it tells you in the word that it's in transgression. So it's in rebellion to God. Right. Yeah. You're okay with all of that? Yeah, I'm good with, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with seven. That one's really clear. The, the horn was able to trample the host. Was able to... Okay, we're in, we're in eight then. The right. horn. Right. So pagan Rome and papal Rome are able to trample the host and the sanctuary. Yes. Okay, so we'll leave the sanctuary for a moment, assuming that's some kind of spiritual uh, struggle of ideologies between one empire, between Satan's empires and God's empire, if we were to think that. Let's think about the host. And I beg your pardon if I'm slowing everybody else down. It's okay. Yeah. okay. If you've got these questions, someone else probably has. Oh, okay. Um, so, when we think about the, the transgression of desolation, which is this power here, in Daniel 8.13, the transgression of desolation is the papacy. The only way the papacy is able to trample down anybody is with an army, with a state. So right in there you see a church-state relationship. If we go to Daniel 11, verse... Five minutes, okay? No more, truly, just five. Because he can only record for so Yeah. You... you Give me a thumbs up and I'll stop straight away. 11.31. What I wanna, the point I want to bring up in 11.31 is here it's called the transgression of desolation in chapter 8. But in chapter 11 it's going to be given a different name. 11.31. And arms shall stand on his part and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily sacrifice and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. So here it's not called the transgression of desolation is called the abomination of desolation. And if you read chapter 12, verse 11, it says the same thing, the abomination that maketh desolate. So this church has got two names. It's got the name of transgression of desolation and the abomination of desolation. So you agree that both of these are talking about the same power. Okay, so you would have to understand why it's got two different names. What's, the per what's these two different names trying to teach us? So my understanding is this, that the transgression of desolation is talking about a church and a state coming together, and the definition of a church and state coming together is the image of the beast. That's what the image of the beast is, when the church and state come together and they work in, in unison with each other. This transgression of desolation it, it, has a, it has only one purpose, and the purpose for that is to do some abominable works. So this abomination is the result of this church-state relationship, and it results in a Sunday law. So you can see that in the history, when you go from pagan to papal, that you get this transgression of desolation. It says it in verse 12. Progressive, progressive move. Yeah, it's, it's progressive. Yes, but, it, but it, its progression comes to a fulfillment in 538. In 538 AD, it stops being the transgression of desolation and becomes the abomination of desolation because here it's going to create a Sunday law in 538, typifying the Sunday law that's going to happen at the end of the world. So there's this subtle difference between the transgression and the abomination of desolation. If we're okay with that, then this, trans, this church is, that's in transgression in verse 12 is the church that's in transgression in verse 13 and the transgression that it's bringing to view there is that it's using a state to assist it to do its work. When we take the concept of 12, 8, 12 and uh, chapter 7 and bring that into chapter 2 then that clay must by definition be this church here that's been spoken of in chapter 8. It's this entity here, it's this entity here. And both of those stories are about a church in transgression. I think you're missing something. I must be. Or, or, or maybe help me out. Why is there a struggle to bind the chapters together like that? Because typically, even in Revelation and in Daniel, there's a, there's a, the way it's written, there's enlarging, there's expression, and it enlarges, and God adds more, and he adds more, and he adds more, and he keeps... 
coming one direction. But why must we go back the other direction and have the same connections? Because I think that's, I don't think that's on point. We'll close, with, we'll close with prayer now and pick it, pick it up at the, in our next study. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your loving kindness. We ask and pray that you would be with us, that you would direct our thoughts and our ideas as we wrestle with the book of Daniel. Chapter 2. May you give us clarity of thought and understanding so that these things may be an abiding influence in our hearts and our minds, that we might not make mistakes and that we might come to right conclusions. Please be with us and direct us, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.